Mesdames et messieurs, les journalistes, je vous présente Bagdad Djilali Difalia. Bonjour, très content de votre présence. Donc, euh, c'est pour vous faire une très grande révélation. Je me suis intéressé tout au début à l'Arche de l'Alliance. J'ai commencé mes investigations euh, dès les années 77, les années 80. Euh, je suis reparti en Algérie, rejoindre mes parents, qui sont partis définitivement à Oran. Et euh, de là, j'ai commencé à fréquenter le musée d'Oran, la bibliothèque municipale, la bibliothèque privée. Et c'est là que vraiment, là, il y a eu le, le grand déclic de l'archéologie, étant donné qu'il y a beaucoup de sites archéologiques en Algérie. Euh, je ne vous les citerai pas parce que ce serait trop long. Quoi. Et euh, voilà, euh, je me suis mis, euh, j'en reviens à l'Arche de l'Alliance. Je l'ai cherché pendant 25 ans exactement. Et euh, ce coffre, il est cité par les trois plus grandes religions monothéistes dans la Torah, la Bible et le Coran. Et n'oublions pas que dans le Coran, il est cité en tant que euh, prophète. Et euh, c'est ce qui m'a euh, donné la pression pour chercher ce, ce coffre, ce fameux coffre. Et euh, je me suis mis à, à, à le chercher, comme certains. Comme, euh, voilà. Donc, euh, comment j'ai abouti euh, au tombeau d'Alexandre le Grand Je suppose que c'est euh, le, le mausolée d'Alexandre, du fait qu'Alexandre est lié à cette arche. Il y a beaucoup de convergences. En fait, quand il a libéré l'Égypte, sous le, le, le joug de Darius, sous le, étant donné que les, il y a eu, ils étaient, c'était un royaume achémite, qui était l'empire de Darius, et les Égyptiens ont été très, 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 très ont beaucoup souffert de ce roi. Donc tout ce que vous voyez ici sont des accès. Hein. Il y a plusieurs accès qui n'ont pas été excavés pour accéder au tombeau, euh, dans cette nécropole royale. Au milieu, on accède à une petite niche où se trouve le sarcophage de, euh, du roi des rois. Voilà. Sur le moment, euh, croyez-moi, quand vous voyez un trésor comme ça, c'est euh, euh, indescriptible. Je ne peux pas vous décrire l'émotion. Euh, je sentais, là, je ne suis pas arrivé au, à l'hôtel, là. Et voilà, Merci. et si vous permettez, euh, je vais juste demander à M. Mebarki oui. une réaction sur ce que vous venez de voir. Je, je ne vois pas l'adjectif que je pourrais utiliser pour euh, commenter les, les, les images que nous venons de voir. Euh, D'autant plus que lorsque je suis arrivé, on m'a certifié que ces photos ont été authentifiées. Donc ce n'est pas, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, ce n'est pas un montage. Il y a plusieurs salles de trésors. En fait, il y a des arbres en or, et en guise de fruits, ce sont des diamants et des émeraudes et des rubis. En fait, il y a une partie du trésor de Babylone à l'intérieur. Je me suis libéré de cette promesse, et voilà, je suis devant vous, je vous le présente ici, et voilà. Et ça me libère, ça me libère, je suis libéré, voilà. Ça me soulage, je veux que le monde entier euh, sache... Euh, que c'est une chose extraordinaire. Hein. Voilà, c'est tout ce que je veux à dire. Voilà. Et c'est mon souhait. Merci beaucoup. Euh, J'imagine qu'il y a des choses qui doivent rester secrètes dans la mesure où vous êtes dans un processus très complexe, notamment des sécurisations du site peut-être, mais il n'y a pas moyen donc de connaître la localisation exacte de cet endroit Je ne peux pas le révéler. Euh, je laisse la révélation euh, à son Altesse royale, le roi de Jordanie. Merci beaucoup, hein, du fond du cœur. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM's YouTube channel. I'm George Nori. Like, share, and subscribe. Also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and coasttocoastam.com. Become a Coast Insider for ad-free access to thousands of shows you'll really enjoy. Have they found the tomb of Cleopatra, Alexander the Great, the Ark of the Covenant? I'll stick around and find out more with Dr. Carmen Bolter when we come back and take your calls on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. Carmen Bolter with us. Our website is linked up at coasttocoastam.com. We'll also take your calls this hour. Carmen, would you say in your career that this discovery may be one of the most exciting ones that you've heard about? 
Absolutely. It's mind-boggling. Yeah, it is. And I'm th- I was thinking about the question that you asked before, like, why didn't it go public? But the thing is, if people haven't heard something before, they tend to reject it. And, you know, we're so conditioned to just be have things repeated and repeated and then to repeat things that we see on the news. And things are quite controlled. So it's 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 really a, a psychological construct in itself that i mean there couldn't be anything bigger than this i mean the, the discoverer himself told me that it's a thousand times bigger than king tut it, 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 it's huge it, it's huge and and if and so when you think about why not just go in there and you know have the cameras ready and all that okay but then what once it's open you know with 14 national guards i mean who's going to protect that and and you know, mm-hmm. it, 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 it cha- it's a game changer. Um, the the tagline for the foundation is, you know, ushering an era of peace and prosperity to the Middle East. Well, you know, we know there's forces against that. So it, it, this could change all of humanity, you know, in, in terms of really understanding the distant past and all of that. But from everything I've done in my career, there seems to be everything operating against that. I'm, you know, I think Cleopatra's tomb and um, Alexander the Great's, uh, th- 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 that's a great discovery, but I'm excited about the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, to me, that echoes the Bible. When, when, the, when you hear things and read things in the Bible, and then you're able to verify it scientifically or in any other way, that authenticates the, the, the Bible stories. It's an amazing, amazing thing. And well, if, for me, it's the material from the Library of Alexandria. Yeah, that's great, now, too. Now, think, think about the teams that would be necessary to go in there. It could be 20 years of research easily. Okay, so there's going to be DNA testing. There's going to be dating. First of all, cataloging of everything. And then, you know, the idea of 3D replicas of mm-hmm. various artifacts and um, uh, sc- sc- scrolls. Uh, computational linguistics, teams of linguists that can translate the information that's in there. But again, you know, there's corruption in the dating labs. There's few people who understand how to use computational linguistics. That happens to be what my PhD is in, you know. And and, and, and would the people who did the translation have it right? Or so you'd have to have it double blind. It'd have to be double, at least. Researching the team, pardon me? It'd have to be at least double checked and rechecked by different sources. Right, and then they they even suggested the idea of an oracle department. And so what kind, you know, how many channels are actually coming up with the things about it? And, you know, who was Alexander the Great that he, you know, in another life that he ended up being there? And, you know, those (laughs) sorts of things are really interesting to me. And so it's strategically moving forward. But I'll tell you this, I heard about it three years ago. Well, that's you're, anything, you're, in, you're, you're in the know, though. But not anything about it or where or anything, just one person who knows a lot of stuff, who keeps his mouth shut about a lot of things, uh, said they found the tomb of Alexander the Great, you know. And I know because he keeps my secrets not to pry him open. <laughs> right. 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 And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And I had the same kind of reaction, like, how do you know? What do you mean? Like, where's the verifiability? <laughs> Tell on me it? more. Been... Tell me more. <laughs> but you can't. You can't with somebody like that. And so then when it came up again, you know, and I'm and they, they approached me, you know, because I do have experience with a lot of these things, not to be doing it all, but to sur- certainly supervising teams and whatnot. And they already knew about my work, but the real link is geoscan, the high the high definition satellite. You know how they find things that are deep under the earth that can yep. go as deep as six miles, no kilometers. That's still dramatic. That is still yes, dramatic. Yes, and it's 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 it has always been accurate. Now, are there... there wasn't as much verifiability with it because they hadn't gone and dug to the places that they did these scans. The other thing is everybody's suffering from non-disclosure agreements. So even the person who helped, there was a pair of people who, scientists, who discovered, their, developed the logarithms for the scan. So there's a different logarithm on a live uh, high-definition satellite scan. There's one for water, one for pottery, one for gold, precious metals, precious jewels. 
right? And so they, they just run the scan with a different formula for each element, right? And so when they were, you know, doing some work with some, you know, anti-gravity and that sort of thing, uh, they fired the guy and made him sign a 20-year non-disclosure Jeez. agreement. Right? And actually, I mean, I feel quite privileged here, A, that they're even talking to me, but when the non-disclosure agreement after 20 years was lifted, I got a phone call. I didn't know who to call. <laughs> Are they cringing because you're talking about it in some form or fashion tonight? No, no, no. They've invited me to. They have. Okay. So they know uh, what's that, going on. But the thing is, they also asked me to cancel my schedule, and so I stopped, you know, I said no to interviews, and, you know, then I thought, well, this is kind of fun not to have to do interviews, and, you know, to kind of have my schedule to myself, and then they said, go, talk. But, you see, the discoverer is French, and that's his only language. Oh, huh, okay. And, you know, everybody doesn't ha- have, you know, the ability to present just because they discovered something. Not that he does or doesn't, but the point of the matter is, is that going public with something is different than the discovery. And I'm cringing a little bit because I've been sitting on this since March. The, oh, the meeting I know, in, and that's not uh, like Paris you. Paris was April 2nd to 4th. And I'm like, well, you know, and, you know, what's the reaction going to be? And, and then what? Uh, and the thing is moving forward. And, and, and humanity deserves to know. Yeah, of course, it it's history. It's, it's part of this planet. And history has been messed up. And we haven't been told the truth. And, you know, research on Atlantis is so obscure, and people, you know, people come to me, they know everything, you know, how know-it-alls get. Sure. You know, they know everything about it because they figure something out, and somebody did a channel message, and they're in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth dimension, and then, you know, and, you know, they got a flood because they were, you know, doing experiments with animals. and But what if Atlantis went on for 60,000 years? <laughs> you know, you can't just take one day out of it and, and, and say you know everything about it. Like, exactly. We have lost, pardon me? Especially, they may have had the incredible technology, flying machines, everything. Yeah, and we've lost our ability to discern. So much of the information and the data has been erased, and we've been told what to think, told what to think. And so school turns us into repeaters. The teacher has the right answer, the one right answer hypothesis, and we repeat. The news repeats, repeats, repeats. You go to a dinner party and everybody's repeating something they read or they heard. Well, the people who own the media have a storyline and a narrative that they want us to know so they lock everything in to you know the basket of whatever ufos oh that's crazy or whatever and everybody's got the opinion that someone has is the opinion of what they listen to so to open your mind to the truth which you're a person who has been doing that for your whole career uh is also tricky there seems to be enough gold in this tomb to upgrade the level of the economy of Jordan for the rest of uh, its existence. Well, or the whole world, if they shared it. Or the, or the whole world, like, that's true. The intellectual property is is super important, but also, you know, like what happened? And, and, and who was Alexander, and how did he, you know, they say, you know, he conquered and all that, but he, 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 he joined with the people, but he was at the front. And all the foot soldiers were behind him, and they followed him because they had a leader. You know, what leader is at the front of the army now? Yeah, it doesn't happen. He, they, they, they trusted him, they respected him, and he was there. Uh, okay, it's... how about this? He was a high-level initiate. Okay, hmm. so there's this huge 22-foot statue of him on the main level of the pyramid, uh, sorry, the, pyramid, the, the uh, National Museum. And I take people to the Rosetta Stone, and then I take them to see Alexander the Great, and then we go off and and do the rest of the tour. And that's something else I wanted to talk to you about, what's going on in the museum and the King Tut exhibit now. Um, and and so he trained in the temples of Isis, and there are temples, there were temples of Isis all over the Mediterranean basin before it was divided into Muslim on the bottom and Christian on the top in 13 countries. You know, so, you know, he, he's there in the museum with the wands of Horus, wearing the pharaonic... Skirt, he was he was an icon. He was an icon, but then when he pa- he was a visionary, but he was also like he was known to be speaking, you know, or listening and speaking to somebody who wasn't there, and his soldiers and generals kind of giggled about him, 
But he was channeling, he was communicating, and that's normal to the Egyptians. That's something that's a skill you develop, and you're communicating with other beings and, you know, or disincarnate entities or whatever. You know, and you and I have had enough airtime to to make to have discussed all these things in other interviews about different subjects. Mm-hmm. So he was a special person. So when he passed at the ripe age of 33, his army generals were just, you know, guys. How did he die? They didn't know, what, was he, they was didn't he, know what to do. Did he, was he killed or did he just die of some disease oh, or something? Who's going to know for sure? I'm guessing, I'm guessing he just died. I don't think he was killed. But then everybody was like, well, now what? We don't have a leader anymore. So they divided his territory up, and then things deteriorated really quickly because I say he was enlightened in a way. And somebody hightailed it off with his gold and, and his body and took it away somewhere. Well, okay, hightailed it off or... Now, the, the discoverer also told me... I mean, you can't believe how interesting these meetings were. Like, it was just... Like, I really, I really was so thrilled because after they approached me, these meetings happened two and a half weeks later. And I'm like, sure, I'll go to Paris and talk to you about that. <laughs> you know, meet the discoverer and all that. That's impressive, Carmen, that they would turn to you for this. I think that's pretty remarkable. Well, good for you. Here's another reason, though. French is my first language. I can do all the reporting in French if you need me to. And I've got the computational huh. linguistics and the, and the DNA analysis and, the, you know, the whole, you know, logistics for the expedition. And, you know, they approached me and, and you know, I don't know if this is going to happen. There's no contract in place. But to be expedition manager. Interesting. Like, Excuse me? Excuse me? Can you repeat that, please? If they, if they make this announcement, will they do it in France or would they do it in Jordan? Well, I'm not at liberty. They asked me not to talk about strategy. You know more, you know more, don't you? Yeah, but it's also the timing. You know, the, the the green light, the nod has to come from the king and you know, you know how governments work. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Just it, I don't think they're particularly hiding anything or they're anyway, I don't know. I mean, the thing is is that it's it's not even a new discovery. There was a press conference with routers like five years ago, and it went flat. Now, it, how no, does nobody, that work? but nobody picked it up. Well, what's picked up? Like this is the discussion now, and this I was hoping that we could get into the why isn't this happening? How would it happen? What would happen if it did get announced? Well, it may happen now since you've been on this program. <laughs> you know, people will start yeah. fishing around and for it. I, I had a little bit of trepidation, you know, and and because like I didn't, I didn't approach your producers. They approached me, and I'm like, okay, what am I going to talk about? Well, what else is there to talk about? <laughs> you know, because I pride myself on not talking about the same thing over and over again. Well, you may have known about this when we were doing our Beyond Belief shows. You must have been biting your lip no, not to tell me. No, I only had heard they found it. And I was, you know, and they, the other thing was I had trepidation about the Nefertiti find and, 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 and you know, and so, I mean, this is a little bit of an act of bravery to, to say anything. Well, I think it's dramatic that it could be Cleopatra's sarcophagus. That's amazing. Uh, but the Ark of the Covenant, that, that to me is phenomenal if, if it well, ends I'm up being you, that. I saw the picture. How do you have melted ruby and the, the gold is still intact? Like, it is a phenomenal machine. And there's something else that I haven't said. When the discoverer went in there in the first place, he goes down the stairs into the thing, and then he felt like he was hit in the head with a two-by-four. And it's like, well, what's that? And he looks around. He's by himself. He's got an oxygen mask and, you know, the light. And he's he's got to be nervous, and his heart's beating like, like crazy, probably. Well, because anything you've been looking for for 20 years, when you know, and no, 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 no. And that was kind of like me, you know, when I found some stuff in Egypt that I looked for for 10 years. You know, no, 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 no. When yes is yes, the no. It's exciting. what no is, and there's a difference, right? Yeah, so, sure yeah. is. Oh no no! But he but he feels like somebody bopped him in his head. Well, but like what a, like it was. an energy burst or something. Yeah, not burst, a protective energetic wall. And uh-huh. this was one of the well, wall isn't the word either. This was the topic. I mean, I was writing notes like mad in this meeting. It's like a force field. Like a force field, 
And there has been hmm. discussion, and this isn't my topic, quantum physics, da, 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 how that would have happened. The other thing is that the salt in the salt mine has acted as a preservative of some kind. Right. And this wasn't... I Okay. The conclusion, I think, that a few of us on the inside circle have come to is that it wasn't supposed to be found. Ever. Ever. Well, the people who put it there. They didn't so plan it. I don't on know it. that they, hmm? I mean, the, whenever they built it or created it, it took this long to find it. Well, and, and King Tut took a good long time to find, too. But the other thing is that, you know, there's stories about that, and I spent a lot of time in the Valley of the Kings, you know, and living in Luxor, by, or staying in Luxor by myself, and I met families, uh, one particular family who, who claimed that, oh, come on, Howard Carter didn't find that. We found it a long time before, and we've been, you know, in the courts for 50 years trying to say that's not his discovery, it's ours. Well, it stands to reason that someone else would have, you know, dropped the, 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 you know, the stone in the hole, and it went dunk, and they went, there's something down there. But, you know, opening the thing and dealing with the artifacts and photographing it is a whole other story. And, you know, we understand how the world works. Let's take some so, calls for you. You ready for some calls? Mm -hmm. Let's take a few now, and then we'll hit the break. And then I want to talk about the King Tut exhibit in Egypt, and then we'll take final phone calls. But first-time caller, Phil, Cleveland, Ohio. Hi, Philip. Go ahead. Is he still with us? This is, uh, this is Bill. Oh, Bill. Okay. I mean, it's, yeah. It looks like it says Phil, but you are Bill. Phil, fair enough. I get that a lot. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the show. Go ahead. You're on with Carmen. Excellent. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, she said something about um, uh, two Ark of the Covenants, and uh, if that was based on anything. And the other thing was, I thought it was just Levites were the ones that could handle the Ark of the Covenant. Hmm. Well, I was just well curious about go, that. go ahead, um, Carmen. I'm not saying that there are two or three. We, I was following what what George had said that it could have been in the Dome of the Rock. It could have been in Ethiopia, and there is something there that resembles an ark. Okay, so do we say there's only one and it moved around, and that there isn't one in Ethiopia? We can't verify that. So I'm suggesting, like I said, toaster technology. There's a technology that we've replicated over and over. I don't have a problem if this technology was really developed with the possibility that there was more than one. That's just what my brain has needed to do to wrap myself around that because I don't want to say it's not in Ethiopia. I don't want to say it's the only one. We don't know yet. So, um, and the Levites were the only ones that could handle it. Um, that's the story. It could be, but I think that it had. They all had a certain charge, and they could have lost their charge. And then it's not as active as it used to be. But just because there's been this discovery doesn't mean that I can tell you the ins and outs of right. Ark of the Covenant technology. We're going to come back in a moment with Carmen Bolter. We'll talk about the King Tut exhibit and take final phone calls here on Coast to Coast AM. And the next hour, we begin our Christmassy discussion of miracles and angels as we continue with that theme. And Carmen's website linked up at coasttocoastam.com. We will be back in a moment. And welcome back. Our final segment with Dr. Carmen Bolter as we talk about this incredible discovery in Jordan. And Carmen, before we take final calls, let's talk about the moving of the King Tut exhibit in Egypt. Is it in a new museum now or going to one? Well, this is the issue. So the new museum is nowhere close to finished. Uh, I've driven past it, taken photographs. I've been going to Egypt twice a year. And... Um, and so they, they say that they're moving it there and that there's been articles in newspapers in uh, Norway, for example, saying uh, that it's free to the public till last February and that you can see just the King Tut thing, and there's articles all over. Now, uh, when they were saying they were building a new library of Alexandria, um, they said in online and in newspapers that it was ready, and then I'd go to Alexandria, and no, they hadn't even dug a hole in the ground, and the distance between when they said it would open and it did open was 12 years. So this time I'm not falling for it. So whenever something happens like that, I get all kinds of emails from people saying, oh, well, now they've moved the King Tut exhibit. Okay. Now, having gone into the, in, into the National Museum for the first time in 77 and studied with Hakim, who's the indigenous wisdom keeper in the Pyramid Code for 10 years, we went over every inch of the museum. 
in two-hour segments over the years. And there's a dedication of the king. There's two full L-shaped wings of King Tut upstairs in the National Museum and a separate room that was just for his chariots. Lots and lots of cases lining these rooms, artifacts in the middle, two separate jewelry rooms. I am telling you that over the last several trips, the thing is being emptied out with cases ripped right off the wall. And the la- and I've got photographs of this because they finally allow you to take pictures in there with your cell phone on a camera pass. And the last time I was in there in October, a whole wing is empty. The whole chariot room's empty, and there's all these packages covered up with plastic and whatnot and crates tucked away behind things. And they say they're moving it to the new museum. Then there was an article that said, oh, I'm so sad there was a fire at the new museum. Well, first of all, what fire? A. B, you couldn't possibly drive a truck in there because it's all mud. And so if they say that the, the, the artifacts that were already moved to the new museum burned in a fire, then what do you think they're doing with them if they're gone? So somebody's taking them? Yes. And selling them or what? Well, one of the boxes, uh, the crate said Roma on it. What, you're sending that one to Rome? To the Vatican? Who knows? Anyway, so it's extremely upsetting because this is all gold, too. It's the next, next, the, the, the last intact tomb found November 4th, 1922, almost 100 years ago. Uh, and any time anybody sees the King Tut exhibit in other cities other than Cairo, it's a replica. A good replica, but not the real thing. So when we hear about the King Tut exhibit is traveling around the world, going to different places, those are the, that's a replica? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And I, I went in there and I went, wait, this doesn't feel quite right. And then I found out the whole thing's a replica. Excellent replica, but the energy's not there. Anyway, so this is what they're doing, and they're lying. And I have to deal, like I bring groups twice a year to Egypt, and people are like, well, I read this article, and they said. And I'm like, well, we have to have something that's verifiable. We, we drive right past the museum. The cranes are there. Crazy. There's no sign of fire. But they're emptying out the King Tut stuff, and there was a lot of stuff in there. When Zahi Hawass was running the show, were things better or worse? Well, if you ask somebody if Zahi's gone, though, some people will say he's gone, some people will say he never left, and other people will say he's got his kids, his children, his boys, doing his work still. So in some strange way, he still has his hands on the keys, the special you know, chambers here and there. Just taking and, a back seat uh, to tra- it. Pardon me? He's taking a back seat, I guess. Yeah, but he's still got the keys, and he charges $500 for 10 minutes of each participant in his group. And he's making a lot of money by being the only person that has access to the keys, because so is he running it, or he's not running it, or he's running it behind the scenes, or, you know, it's hard to know, but I say he's not gone. So, but are you saying tonight that you think somebody is stealing King Tut artifacts? Well, not one by one out of the museum because of all the security, but I think that there's some organized something or other that is moving that stuff out of there. And I can show you the progress of of pictures that I took for the pyramid code that I had a $5,000 permit to take and stuff that I took when nobody had camera passes in 1977. And every six months for the last three years. Let's take the final calls. West of the Rockies, Christian's with us in San Pedro, California. Hi, Christian. Go ahead, sir. Hello, George. Hello, doctor. Um, I had a question, but I wanted to comment on you. Last night, Craig had a guest on, or or George had a a, a guest on his show last night, Craig Hewlett, and Mm -hmm. Craig also mentioned that everything you see, hear, and read uh, when it comes to information, is controlled by six corporations. So it's no surprise that the truth does not come out. I wanted to comment that uh, Alexander was no tenderfoot. Um, he led his men from the front. Uh, when you look at his, you know, the Battle of uh, the Granicus, uh, the Battle of Isis, uh, the famous siege of Tyr, which was up near, I think, near Tel Aviv in Israel. He was right there. Uh, the Battle of Gagamela. 
But the, but the question I have, Doctor, is that in the Hollywood film Cleopatra, there is a scene in the film where Elizabeth Taylor and also Rex Harrison, who plays Caesar, is apparently she takes um, Caesar to Alexander the Great's tomb in the film. And in the film, Alexander's tomb is all crystal. And I had someone who told me quite a while ago, several years ago, that Alexander the Great's tomb, as described in ancient writings, was absolutely spectacular in all hand-carved of crystal. But yet Hollywood doesn't really follow history accurately. So I'll take my, uh, my answer on the air. And if I wanted to follow up with the rest of your developments, do I go in and just uh, check your webpage um, online, ma'am? And good luck. Yes, and, and I, ha I have stuff. developed a Patreon page, and I will be putting statements up there for, for my Patreons. So, uh, okay, thank you. What and, and Carmen, so what about the crystallized tomb of Alexander? Okay, so we, we know about Hollywood. We know about six corporations. Crystal, crystalline, salt is crystalline. It's my first thought. Um, there's no way they, well, I mean, it's just so big. If there's 32 rooms on one level and 12 on another, you know, and then a third level, um, and if it's hidden, uh, I think the crystal may be referring to salt. That could be. That could be. And I think that anybody doing the movie way back then uh, would not have known about this discovery. What do you think is more dramatic, the discovery that it could be Cleopatra's tomb or and uh, Alexander the Great's tomb? Well, the fact they're, that they're both together. big, of course. The fact that they're together. Yeah. I mean, this is showing a a big organizational thing, and and the discoverer told me that the tomb was probably open for about three hundred years. Why no Mark Anthony? Well, what happened to him? Well, I want to know that too. And and the thing is, maybe one of these gold sarcophagi was him. I mean, we got to do DNA testing, right? And and see. I mean, there's way more questions than there are answers at the moment, but it's pretty exciting to think that there's clues. These gold statues that you said are life-size, are they plated, or do you think they're all gold, 100%? Oh, my solid. God. And there's, an, there's Isis figures, there's caryatids that are like the female figures that hold up the part, part of the Parthenon. Uh, these, and there's a lot of feminine stuff in there, you know, me and the matriarchal, uh, and life-size horses and chariots and Alexander himself. It's stunning. I bet. Dave in New Jersey. Hi, David. Go ahead, sir. Uh, yes, doctor. Uh, I have a confession to make to you, to George, and the entire Coast audience. I had sex with Cleopatra. You did? I well, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, good for you. <laughs> hey. Uh huh. Um, I sure hope he didn't uh, play around in the in the sarcophagus, though. <laughs> it, he's in there too. No, but that doesn't work. Only on this show. <laughs> Richard in Santa Monica. Hey, Richard. I hope you don't top that. Uh, I, I'm still laughing. Um, <laughs> Uh, love your show, George. Thanks. Um, so they, I, we found you found uh, Alex, um, Cleopatra's Alexander the Great and the Ark of the Covenant in one room, one area, one big tomb, one, one big tomb, and I suppose it's speculation. Um, but I'm telling you, this discoverer has lots and lots of research, and he was in there and. That's what he thinks, and it makes sense listening to him. And this is the best we've got until we get in there and and we can verify some of it. I would love yes. to know I mean, more about. Is, what you think like, about pardon me. I would love to know more about the technology you talk about the Ark of the Covenant. That's fascinating. But um, what about the um, the Oak Island show that that talk about the Ark of the Covenant being there? Mm -hmm. I mean that that's quite fascinating, and I would think. Um, there's other artifacts buried there, and then mariners talk, and then if something like that was brought over there by the Templars, um, other people would fall in their wake because it's like a you know holy place. But, um, Doctor, I was wondering, would you 
Could you speculate on the arc being at uh, Oak Island? Oak Island in Nova Scotia, Carmen. Uh, I had a guest on a few weeks ago who talked about the possibility that the Knights Templar may have taken it and dropped it into this massive pit and covered it up, you know, to hide it for the rest of time. But there again, another story of where the ark could be. So, I mean, it it's pops up all over the planet. Well, exactly, and people want to know. And I think what this speaks to is our curiosity, and people can conjure up stories. And, uh, again, until we can verify something, it's a story. Exactly. I- I- exactly. Now, with, the, with DNA testing... How could they determine who someone may be? Don't, don't they need original DNA in order to compare it? I, I don't know how that works. Well, mitochondrial DNA goes through the matrilineal line, and one of the things in patriarchal dynastic Egypt was that the next pharaoh had to marry the daughter of the pharaoh before him to keep everything going down the NP DNA line. And so, um, but the, it, the simplest thing, if they are Ptolemies and only one of them was a half-brother to Alexander and the one with the, the, the dagger was Alexander, obviously a, a more grandiose uh, sarcophagus and burial, are they different? Is anybody related? Mm-hmm. And so what do we have? I mean, what do we have? For, if that's the only thing, is that they're all different and no one's related except the half-brother, then we have some information that they could easily have been the Ptolemies. What does this tell because you? In any other dynasty, they have to be blood-related. Go ahead. What does this tell you about history? If these discoveries prove to be true, uh, about uh, the knowledge of history that has been passed on that we've been able to keep, and then all, all of a sudden we verify it thousands of years later. It's amazing. Well, his, history is when the soldiers came, his story. And uh, there's been a lot of fighting and a lot of stealing and a lot of uh, stick them up, give us your stuff. So I think, and then, his, the, you know, the story's written by the victors, and it's all war. And I, I've said it to you before, I think we're going to come to see the last 5,000 years as the patriarchal hiccup. Everything else was more peaceable. We, we can't possibly conceive that the earth existed for many millennia in peace, because everybody thinks that, you know, there's always been war and that's the condition, and they just conditioned us to accept that, and I do not accept it. So history is a mess. But I think the truth is waiting for us. Is this region under heavy uh, guard and security? Yes, there's 14 National Guards, but they're not close to the tomb. They're down the road, and uh, the place has been, you know, camouflaged. And, yes, it's, it's heavily guarded, no well, question. With that amount of gold in there, you would think Fort Knox soldiers would be out there. You know, who knows? Well, and who knows what's going to happen now that the cat's out of the bag. Um, and uh well, that's Hopefully a good point. Hopefully it'll be interesting, and, and the thing is, is that this is not new. As I told you, I heard about it three years ago. And there's, you know, the, the routers thing happened five years ago at least, and the discovery happened before that. So maybe this will push things along that will, you know, force the issue of, come on, let's see, and hopefully we have the capacity to protect it. Quick question from Dylan in North Carolina. Go ahead, Dylan. We'll squeeze you in here. Uh, yes, um, great show. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, uh, Ron Wyatt's discovery that he made back all the way back in 1981. He, he says that he had uh, an archaeological dig there in Jerusalem in the Old City, mm-hmm. and he actually um, found uh, the area where they had done the crucifixion the Romans did, and they found a, a tunnel and excavated and found the Ark of the Covenant. And the most amazing thing about the story is that he found um, blood on it. And he took the blood to a lab in Israel to have it tested. And it should have been, you know, dead. It was, you know, like hundreds of years, thousands of years old. But uh, when they reconstituted it with a saline solution, it was still alive. Absolutely incredible. Which is story. remarkable. Then he, got, then he got, like, attacked, and, uh, like, people tried to discredit him and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. no, he was an explorer. He's the one who also claims that he found Noah's Ark uh, up there on Mount Ararat. Ron Wyatt no longer with us anymore, Carmen, uh, as we wrap this up. But he claims that he did find the Ark of the Covenant. And here's, again, another story 
of where it could be. Carmen, would you keep in touch with us on this story? Any more breaking news, let us know. I certainly will, George. Great, and have yourself a great Christmas, okay? You too. Thank you so much. Dr. Carmen Bolter, her website linked up at coasttocoastam.com. Remarkable story. Up next, time for angels. Get ready. Thank you for listening to Coast to Coast AM on our official YouTube channel. I'm your host, George Norrie, and don't forget to visit the Coast Insider membership area on coasttocoastam.com, where you can access our past, upcoming, and classic shows. Hi, this is Dark Journalist. Today I'm excited to bring you the thrilling update to the excavation in Turkey of ancient Egyptian artifacts with Dr. Carmen Bolter of the University of Calgary. Now, Carmen's five-part Netflix documentary series, The Pyramid Code, changed our understanding of life in ancient Egypt. And with her new documentary series, The New Atlantis, she's going to go even deeper. Now, we've received an amazing response on the exclusive reporting that we did in the first two episodes on this amazing find. In this special episode, we'll bring it all together with the Atlantis-Egyptian connection and how it all relates to the mysterious Hall of Records. History really is being changed right before our eyes. Here we go. Dr. Carmen Bolter, Atlantis to Egypt, the missing link discovered. This question about Atlantis will not go away. The Hall of Records is about how we got here. The potency of the technology from Atlantis, the the real secrets of personal empowerment is threatening to the deterioration of what's gone on now. The Hall of Records, it stands to reason that it would be material from another race, another time frame. That's what is in the turkey find. So there's a big story here that's been hidden from us. Hidden, hidden, hidden. Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with Dr. Carmen Bolter and even more exclusive images from this fantastic find in Turkey of ancient Egyptian artifacts. And I want to say right here that these images are being provided by Dr. Carmen Bolter exclusively to the Dark Journalist Show. You can't find them anywhere else, and uh, we're definitely happy to have them. Now, Carmen, I want to mention to you that we've had a tremendous response to the first two episodes uh, on this incredible find in Turkey of Egyptian artifacts, and I'm still getting tons of emails on it every day. So am I. (laughs) (laughs) Now, before we get started, I want to give a shout out and say thank you to all of the independent sites who covered this story and really pushed it out there. Uh, There's over 300 of them so far, including ForbiddenKnowledgeTV.net, that's Alexandra Bruce, EventChronicle.com, ProjectAvalon.com, BeforeIt'sNews.com, that's Jeffrey Pritchett from the Church of Mabus Radio posting there, EducatingHumanity.com, TheHagmanReport.com, Galactic Connection, Disclose.tv, ShiftFrequency.com, Out of Mind, That's OOM2.com. Dimensionsandbeyond.com. Information-machine.blogspot.com. Just incredible support, and we thank you for getting this story out. And I also want to thank you, the Dark Journalist subscribers, viewers, and supporters. We couldn't do any of this work without you. And unfortunately, you're not going to see this kind of amazing revelations on National Geographic, folks. But we certainly are going to do our best to bring you all the real news that's out there. Now, Carmen, there's a lot of fascination around this incredible find in Turkey uh, and a lot of the implications of what it could mean. A lot of the revelations that it's bringing to the surface, it's really another incredible chapter in the great work that you've been doing. And I want to say that whenever your research has touched on that Amarna period, there seems to be just a little extra magic uh, to it. Uh, there's, there's some kind of special connection that you seem to resonate with and bring forward in all of this research. And of course, that royal line includes uh, Queen Hatshepsut, 
the Pharaoh Akhenaten, uh, his wife, Queen Nefertiti, and of course, the boy king, Tutankhamun, or King Tut. Now, it seems that you've discovered something very special about this period in terms of what it means and what it could mean for humanity. Can you tell us about it? Well, it, what it is, is a percolation up of what was happening in Egypt before and what was happening in Atlantis. And so I think that Hatshepsut herself understood her, herself to be starseed, that somehow her father was overtaken by a being when he impregnated her mother. And she, she believes herself to have been a starseed, which many of us are. I think we come from the stars and that's this whole extraterrestrial thing. Like, what does that mean? Right. And, and how are we here in the first place? But we have so much rhetoric in an effort to try to understand who we are, we're, you know, looking the wrong way. Uh -huh. And then Nefertiti and Akhenaten themselves, I mean, if they had the distended skulls and they were different beings, and who knows if they were far older, you know, and the beings were being, um, you know, respected by a later generation, but still they also were starseed. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what does it mean? And, and then all of the distended skulls that are being discovered all over the planet that usually pertain to giants. And, you know, and it's, it's like a whole different level of humanity, if you will, or whatever you want to call it. And so I think that there's an incessant curiosity in people about who are we and where did we come from. And I think that's who your listenership is, is the people who just don't accept what we're being told. Right. And want a real answer. Well, what is the real answer? And the real answer is being, you know, swept under the carpet and hidden. And sooner or later, it's, it's coming out. But, you know, even that turkey find, I think, you know, I was charging all my batteries. I was invited to come and do the shoot. And next thing we knew, they're kicking all the Americans out of Turkey and then closing the border and then this big flood of refugees. Hmm. You know, like, what, what is that? Well, it's obscuring this major find in a big way, for sure. But we're bringing some of this incredible discovery forward here, now. And I want to bring everyone up to date on what we've presented so far. So I'm going to play this presentation of the images we've released so far, and then we'll come back and discuss the reaction and show even more exclusive new images of this historic excavation. Here we go. Uh, astonishing sarcophagus, highly resembling the one in Tut's tomb breathtaking in its detail and here the statues of Amenhotep III, Akhenaten and assorted gods of ancient Egypt just staggering in its implication initial dating 10,000 BC completely rewrites history now let's get into the new ones but there were some coins well look at these I mean they almost look like smarties but there's ones that they're the exact thing from Nosso. Amazing. They look like they're in excellent condition, and again, from a later time period here, so there may be a tradition of hiding artifacts in this mountain. Until they basically had to stash it. Look at this for a bronze. Oh, that is almost Grecian looking. I know, it's just simply amazing. And all this goddess stuff. Huh. All right, this is how the pictures came to me. Oh, do you ever wonder about your amazing luck in these matters? You seem to be a magnet for them. Right. And so how that ended up in my, you know, hands is, is remarkable to me, you know, but it's true. So I, I was told that uh, James Ernest Brown was sending me the, the 16 millimeter footage of Lead Scallion the next morning is when these pictures started to come across in one of my meetings. That's fascinating. And... You know, and then when the Geoscans guy's um, gag order was lifted, he contacted me. I mean, you've got to understand, for me, I'm like, how is this happening? <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's totally great and amazing. And even the idea of, of, of where I'm called to go next, you know, in Europe, and there's possibly pyramids there. It's like, what is this? <laughs> it's like, it's quite... Well, you're getting all these signals as you bring Atlantis to the surface, it seems like. So look at this one even has an elephant. from Atlantis. It's an Atlantean elephant. And this is a lamp that has two different spigots. 
This is the kind of stuff they're finding. Isn't it amazing? Well, that these different finds are all related to one major excavation is very interesting. And look at this. What is that? A miniature mummy. Wow. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Oh, these are great. These are absolutely stunning. All right, we've saved the best for last. Evidence is pointing to the fact that this represents an Atlantean princess of extreme antiquity. The sarcophagus dating came back 10,000 BC. This could, in fact, be older. Yeah, Yeah, and let's just keep the conversation going here. This is a wooden life-size statue that must be Thai. So those are jewels inlaid into gold. Oops, same one. Look at the headpiece. Look at this stuff. Mm. Isn't that just incredible? Wow. I know, super wow. Okay, so go ahead. What were you We're saying? looking at an Atlantean crown. Yeah, yeah, it's a crown that goes with the head, this, and it goes with this outfit. So the jewels, oh, okay. see those I see. breasts? I see. I guess, maybe not, because she's on her side. But it, when you see the, uh, I've seen other ones where it's actually those pants that gather at the ankle. Mm-hmm. And this is a life-size, life-size statue. This, from all the data, is an Atlantean princess. The fact that she's linked with the Amarna artifacts is suggesting a lineage, perhaps Atlantis to Egypt. That's what it looks like. We're going to need to explore the gap of time from 10,000 BC to 1300 BC and Amarna, and that's Atlantis to Egypt, and who this Atlantean princess was, and the legacy into Egypt. Well, and I always said that there was, you know, that the. Patriarchal Egypt started in 3113 BC, coinciding with the Mayan calendar. Let's not forget that. And then became increasingly patriarchal and less spiritual. But then in the 18th dynasty, something started to percolate up with Hatshepsut. And there was also something going on with the solar flares that were preventing boys from surviving. And Morris Cotterell talks about that. So fertility was definitely in question, and a lot of the boys were, were stillborn. Which is why they were having trouble finding somebody to, for the throne. But they were also returning to the Aten instead of the Amun, right? Exactly. And means darkness, and we still say Amen, which I won't say. Um, so, yeah, I think that they were percolating up a memory, and they broke away from and closed the temples because it was corrupt. And, and on that note, you know, we... we that God sent the flood because the Atlanteans were mixing their DNA animals and, you know, and have you seen a human ear growing on the back of a rat now? Right. And so if corruption is causative for a flood, uh, that's not exactly adding up now because we sure have enough corruption. Absolutely. And I know we're going to have many questions on these incredible artifacts yeah. and more research is being done as we speak. But what an incredible collection that will really change our perspective on ancient Egypt and Atlantis forever. Just amazing stuff, Carmen. Okay, so that's a pretty good cross-section there of what has been presented so far here on Dark Journalist. Now, for the full context of how the dating by traditional Egyptology could be so far off, uh, over 8,000 years, you've actually spoken extensively about a cover-up in archaeological circles regarding ancient Egypt and especially this Amarna period. Now, can you go into that here? Because it may affect the historic find in Turkey as well. Right. Now, the discovery of King Tut's tomb is part of it. But there's a lot of corruption that went on with that, too. You think Howard Carter didn't help himself to a lot of the stuff. Right, right. And most people don't know that he was covered in blue lotus flowers when he was found. And and he does have a distinct skull, but most people aren't noticing that, as did a lot of the high court there. It is so unusual. And the, and the beings that they found that they say were Nefertiti. But we'll never know about that either. Right. So there really has to be a combination between some real, real things and memories. But who focuses it? Who's going to spend that much time focusing on it? Yeah. Pretty much anything and everything that's been said about it, Don, was just wrong. Including at that press conference that Zahi... Hawass was, you know, saying that he had malaria yeah, and he had a clump foot and he had a hair, a hair lip. and It's all the medical model. Yeah. What's wrong with the DNA. Now, most people don't know that the traveling King Tut exhibit is all fake because the King Tut stuff stays in Egypt. That's fascinating. Just like a lot of discoveries that are made in Egypt, uh, you know, in, in the Zahi era, 
everybody would have to stop working. Zahi would come along and say, look what I discovered. Oh, boy. Everything was his. Hmm. So, um, you know, the corruption is immense in all of this. But how, what do we, you know, what was taken already before? But the thing is, is they didn't understand what that material was. And those Faraday cages, if you will, and the so-called mummification beds and why they had gold shoes and how that was all the electric ancient Egyptian work of uh, James Ernest Brown, who really, I think, made some pretty important discoveries about what they were doing and then took it to the lab and then did some experimentation to see if his theoretical position would work. You know, so it's much, much more than going, I'm right because I said so. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot more. But what was the threat? Why do they have to trash McNaughton mm -hmm. and discount? And then why were there so many girls? You know, I think we've mentioned this before, Maurice Cotterell's work. Yes. Roller cycles. Flares, yeah. Making it more difficult for males to, um, to, pardon me, to incarnate and, and stay healthy. Well, this is just the kind of thing that helps us to understand that period and the challenges happening there that we just won't find in textbook archaeology. Now, I want to say that your 30-plus years of doing these excavations, documentaries, and deep research on ancient Egypt really gives your work an edge. To have that on-the-ground experience is something for which, in my opinion, there's just no substitute. Now, in a major find like this Akhenaten and Nefertiti uh, objects in Turkey, without the establishment backing it, and National Geographic specials and all the rest, there's going to be people out there who'll say, well, how can it be real? How can it date to 10,000 BC? This can't be happening. And I just go back to your expertise with these objects. You know, you have the experience, you understand ancient Egypt, and also you've seen on the ground, on the establishment side, and also hoaxers too. So you know the difference. And I would remind everyone listening that has a hard time seeing Egypt going back to 10,000 BC that the Gobekli Tepe site in Turkey, which you hear so much about now, was actually found in the early 90s. And the media, you know, hasn't covered it for 20 years. And now suddenly they're covering it on a limited basis. And they still haven't acknowledged how this 10,000 uh, BC dating changes everything and really throws out the model that we're using for archaeology. So we can't hang around for them. Now, I trust your expertise and the feeling that you have when you know that you have a history-changing find on your hands. Well, and, th and thank you for that. And it is a feeling. Now, there was someone who sent me a video that they had found on Facebook that was similar in a very uncanny way. Yes. So there was a sarcophagus, and there were the Shakti dolls, and there were statues and, and various things. And to me, it looked like a movie set. Oh. done by someone who's not fine-tuned to the information. Now, when you're in Egypt, if you go to a papyrus factory, or you know, they, they, they paint the columns and they've got some ordinary person trying to replicate uh, the posture or you know, even the, the temple pillars. And it's, it's, it's wonky. It's not real. It's, it's, in a way, it's kind of sickening because it right. doesn't keep that precision. And, you, you know, Chris Dunn's work with the, he calls it the Ramsey's face, but actually it's Amenhotep III, and he admitted that. Um, but the proportion of everything, and in Egypt, everything is proportional. Mm -hmm. So when the proportions are slightly off, to me, it, it just doesn't resonate, and I get a really strong reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And so, and I could point out bit by bit between this fake video and the real one where the problems are. Because I've been looking at these pictures. I mean, I went to Egypt the first time in 77, and I've been poring over the pictures. And that's also how James Ernest Brown did his research in 78. Yes. He's got 15,000 pictures. I have 20-some thousand. And you just look and look and look, and you can see if something's fake. That is so fascinating. And that's an internal process, really, because your eye has developed to a point where you can now recognize these fine details in ancient Egyptian artwork. So for you... You can spot a fake almost easily now. Uh, now, this other video that you mentioned, and we've seen these floating around, it almost comes off like a caricature of the videos and images that you have. My first thought was that it was an early bootleg uh, taken on a cell phone, because we know this dig has been underway for a few years. But um, with you saying that it looks like a staged version of the original, that really resonates, and it gets us into a very strange place. 
because we have to wonder now if it's an attempt to cover up or exploit this authentic discovery that you're involved in. Well, it's, it's definitely uncanny. Yeah. That it's even there. And, uh, and it's got the similarity of like a cave and things being thrown in. But, you know, like the other thing that really gets to me is when you see a reenactment of Egypt and people aren't standing with that posture. And when you see the, um, the bands around the top of their arms and their, their wrists and ankles, that was so they didn't get, I call, electromagnetic cuties. Uh-huh. But any reenactment of Egypt that I see, they're all kind of hunched over. And, you know, if that energy came through them and they were like that, it would wipe them out. Sure. They wouldn't survive it. And so, you know, there's a blend here between past life memory and just spending decades looking at the stuff. But there's a feeling that comes off it as well. Oh, there's no question. But you've also told me that whenever we get around these Amarna figures uh, and the displays of their artifacts, strange things do happen. You know, I remember the story of when they moved King Tut's mummy and there was a huge blackout in Cairo. So there's something about the objects around this royal uh, Amarna lineage. That, there was a hatchet suit. Um, there, it was the first time that all her statues were together um, since the find. Because somebody took all her statues and threw them in a pit, and they all broke as they fell in. Mm. And then an American team came along and found them, and then they ended up distributed all over the world. Right. And so it ended up at the Metropolitan Museum, and I've got a full film shoot of it. And it's interesting because it's happened to me before, even when I went to see the real Nefertiti in Berlin. The watchmen see me, and they walk out of the room and leave me there by myself. Interesting. I know. It's just so touching because the minute there's another consciousness there, it interferes with the Egyptian stuff. And to be alone with all those hatchets and statues, I mean, it, and with Nefertiti, it, it, I'd start crying. I mean, it just brings me to tears. It's just so powerful. But when, then several of those statues did leave the Cairo Museum to join this collection. And as I said, I photographed the whole thing extensively. But they never went back to Egypt. Wow. Mm-mm. Amazing. Oh. oh, I find that very disturbing somehow. It's, it's totally disturbing. There's a lot of disturbing things about Egypt. Yeah, there's no question. Now, before we get to showing some more of these incredible exclusive images, I want to touch on some of your more intuitive moments so when you've been in the field investigating these ancient mysteries. Now, one incident we should really talk about had to do with an amazing moment of realization around this idea of a sacred ritual uh, involving this birthing pool. Now, some of the information you were getting around this image was very interesting. Oh, it's, it's, it's totally interesting. And so I thought it was Nosos. And it's interesting because when we have, when I have certain memories, I want to place it somewhere and I call it patching until I can actually ascertain 100% that that's maybe 85%, whatever, but that, that that's what I think and where it could have happened. I make up a place. Mm-hmm. So this birthing pool that I kept seeing, I thought it was at, at Nassos. And maybe there were similarities because I think there's a relationship between the ancestry at Nassos and the ancestry in Egypt. But when I got to Amarna and we were where the North Palace is, there were six of us and Hakim was there. And there was this woman, and she just burst into tears when she saw the birthing pool. And as she was crying, I could see that the birthing pool was turning to blood. And she was a midwife. Or she recalled herself to possibly have been a midwife during that period of time. And there were so many stillbirths, and the boy babies weren't surviving. And then it all fell into place, that all those memories that I had ascertained were Nosos, actually were there. But I had no way of knowing. I had I had no context to put it in, so I put it in a context that I had. That's why I think it's we shouldn't be concluding. Yes. Too quickly, that something is somewhere. You know, until I figure out the rest of it, it looks like it could be here. Right. 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 And so that's why there were no boy children. Now we're already in dynastic Egypt, but they were starting to function like the matriarchal aspects, like Atlantis could have been. So Amarna was like a, a replica, if you will, of the social nature of the, I call it flattening of the hierarchies. So it's not the big boss and, you know, the little people who do all the work and the big guy that gets all the money, you know, and we've had that. And that's why the, I've said it many times, the agenda of the patriarchy is to erase evidence of everything other than itself. Hmm. 
right? And so, and then there's this little percolation that comes up through Hatshepsut and that comes up through the Amarna period, but they would have most certainly been great grandchildren of each other, great grandparents, direct lineage. And that's what a dynasty is. It goes through the same family until that family expires. And that's what the mitochondrial DNA is all about. And that's why even in Pharaonic Egypt, the Pharaoh would marry the daughter of the Pharaoh before him to keep the mitochondrial DNA, which is all matrilineal. I see. Right? And and even though it's it's dynastic and patriarchal Egypt, they still had to keep that matrilineal line because they understood what it meant. Right? And that's how we can trace things. So, um, you know, what is the political agenda for us thinking Akhenaten's crazy? Right. You know, and they're trying to say, well, you know, you know, they, they just mix it all up. It's fascinating the way it's portrayed with that ever-present slant uh, against Akhenaten. And this brings us back to this explosive finding in Turkey of ancient Egyptian artifacts uh, looking very similar to this Amarna period, but dating to 10,000 BC. So let's go down this road a little here. Let's say that the early dating holds up and you're able to get an even bigger investigation going on these artifacts, the probable reality is uh, over 8,000 years of difference between what archaeology has given us that Akhenaten and Nefertiti and Tut date back to 1300 BC, and what this discovery proves, that Amarna actually dates to 10,000 BC. So are we looking at the first Akhenaten at 10,000 BC and the last one in 1300 BC. Now, this is a key breakthrough. The other thing uh, that substantiates your idea of Nefertiti fleeing Egypt when the corrupt Amun priesthood was coming for Akhenaten and hiding these artifacts in Turkey is that she's not represented in the Turkey find, but the whole period of Amarna is. That's why I think, well, it's part of why I think it had something to do with her. Yes, right, right. But it could be more than 8,000 years. But the other thing is that there's other finds along the Silk Road. There's all of these treasure maps, and you go up through the mountains, and there's pathways with arrows and things. And I'm sure the treasure map, would, when you see this, then turn left and mm-hmm. go up and around. And we stash this stuff over there, so the treasure maps would have had as much value. But so much gold, 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 gold coins, gold bars just incredible. But if you look at the entirety of the collection, of which I have 147 pictures that were sent to me, seven some videos, which have bazillions of artifacts, and some of these photographs have like 100 pieces in this, it's matriarchal. And it's all based, like my book, Angels and Archetypes, an Evolutionary Map of Feminine Consciousness, Goddesses. We've got Medusa, we've got Artemis, they're recognizable, there's angels flying around, there's bare-breasted women, and that would have been, you know, a matriarchal. There's certain things about matriarchy, spirals, red, white, and black, you know, the, you know, virgin mother crone, the virgin being the white, the mother being red, and the crone being black. But this was all part of the goddess-centered traditions mm-hmm. that are all buried deeper, because older is deeper in archaeology. Archaeology started in 1910. And so they're pulling all the surface stuff, which is all the patriarchal stuff, Mm -hmm. arrowheads and spears and all that sort of thing, right? So that's all the patriarchal, let's go blow it up and kill it, Mm -hmm. you know? But that's not what was going on before us. Well, this is intriguing because we're looking at cover-ups in archaeology from different angles. You know, on one hand, we have the dating back to 10,000 BC and beyond that destroys their version of history. And then we have this cover-up of the goddess-centered civilizations and their teachings. But this is what I find fascinating. The Amarna find in Turkey, uh, that we've been so heavily focused on here, really speaks to people on this other kind of subtle level. And it's almost like they recognize the powerful nature of this discovery. Now, one of the comments from a guy writing from France, uh, you know, he was saying he felt he was getting water after being thirsty for years. This is the kind of reaction and impact that I think you're having uh, with this historic find. And the new Atlantis is going to open up a whole new avenue of awareness uh, around our ancient past. I'm excited. The Dark Journalist viewers are certainly excited. This is so important. 
you know, we're at a real turning point here. We need in this world of independent research, independent media, to get behind these real uh, bona fide discoveries. You know, we need to lock into something that is provable. And I'll try to make the point here without getting too specific, but there's really a big wave of very, let's say, unverifiable claims. Flat Earth, Corey Good, all that flotsam and jetsam swirling around and degrading the conversation on many levels. And here we are with your unique work. We know real archaeology has been blocked. This is a major breakthrough. So let's get behind this discovery. Let's get behind Carmen's work. Let's get behind this show, you know, share it and make sure this discovery is seen far and wide, whether someone can accept the dating or not, make sure they get the chance to see it. I think we need to ask ourselves, are we going to let 2017 be another year of PR in the mainstream media and in alternative circles, you know, Tom DeLonge and fantasy novels masquerading as UFO truth and coast to coast becoming a paranormal dating service? You know, this is dark journalism. I don't know what the other stuff is. But as dark journalist, I'm looking for the truth, and so are you. Okay, when we come back, Carmen, the new exclusive images from this historic find in Turkey. Atlantis, Amarna, Starseed Connection. Changing history, right here with Dr. Carmen Bolter. Stay with us. Dark Journalist subscribers renew early and save. For a limited time, you can go to darkjournalist.com forward slash renew and renew your subscription at the discount rate of just $39 for one full year. Lock in last year's discount for a savings of $30 and get the shows you want to hear at this special discount. Don't miss out. Renew early and save by going to darkjournalist.com forward slash renew or use the renew link on the member page. See you there. We are back. This is Dark Journalist, and I'm speaking with Dr. Carmen Bolter. Uh, Carmen's five-part Netflix series, The Pyramid Code, really shook up the archaeological world. Uh, her new series, The New Atlantis, set for release later this year, is really looking at evidence for the lost continent of Atlantis, and she puts it in a whole new way. And in the midst of all this, the incredible discovery of Egyptian artifacts from the Pharaoh Akhenaten Tutankhamun and the Amarna period in Turkey. So we're providing you an up-close, exclusive, early look at this groundbreaking excavation. And you can be sure that after we show you these new exclusive images, we're going to do a fourth installment, and there's more there. So stay up to date with us by going to darkjournalist.com and signing up for our newsletter so you don't miss any of the important information that we have coming up for you. Now, Carmen, you're going to be showing some fascinating images from this Turkish discovery. And while we're queuing that up, can you tell me how you feel about people writing to you, you know, from all over the world and sharing their impressions of these artifacts? You're finding there's a special kind of quality to the reaction that you've been getting as if people are starting to penetrate to that next layer of understanding. Yeah, absolutely. But the, the, and the, the pe people are most enthused about academics, meeting metaphysics yes and they're like how did you get away with that well you know we have to keep ourselves intact and we have to follow our own you know path i mean it's 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 the mission that we you know most people are disconnected from their own personal mission mm -hmm. nothing in school encourages us to find that and then everybody buys into the fear about not traveling and <clears throat> cnn mentality the only place you're safe is on your own couch and so people end up disconnected, but it's not very satisfying for them. You know, like this question about Atlantis will not go away. Right. And if people haven't heard something before, I mean, they expect just complete recycling of everything. You just, you know, like with, with, with the turkey find, people, well, I went online, I didn't see anything about a turkey find. Well, because it's not out. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't find it online. It's like people, you know, people have, have stopped really thinking. And, yeah, 
there's a, there's a lot of just regurgitate, regurgitate. And that's what school teaches people to do is hear what the teacher says and say it, repeat it. And so we've got all these people listening to certain um, sources of media and repeating it. How frustrating is that, though, if you're on the verge of this incredible find, you're working with this material, and somebody says, oh, I didn't see it on CNN today. It's not on National Geographic. So, you know, I'll wait till those guys verify it for me. Well, we know that they're all <laughs> start to meme about fake news. <laughs> right, exactly. Who's fake? Yes. You have to fit on a ticker tape going across. And it's all lies. Yeah. But people have disconnected from their own whether something is true meter. You know, we, we need to have an internal uh, resonance to see if something's true for us or if something fits. And that's why I think I, the, the pyramid code was overwhelming to people because they didn't feel all messed up by it. Yes. You know, like if you watch some of these documentaries, yes, no, yes, no, and everything's opposite and anything about food, eat eggs, no, don't eat the white, don't eat the yolk, don't eat them at all, they're perfect food. Like anything, you can find the contradictions. Yeah, oh, sure, sure. You know, the rules, the rules keep changing. The people who make rules love to change the rules. And uh, so, so people don't even know how to sift things through anymore. But we end up with all this cognitive dissonance when, you know, the, the, the headline of an article has the opposite of it in the article. You know, whatever it says at the beginning of the article, they're saying the opposite at the end. And so people just give up and go, oh, I don't know. Right. And then here comes the product and the commercial and they go, okay, I'll go buy one of those, <laughs> you know, unconsciously. And so it's worked. Like whatever the system has done to disconnect yeah. people from the truth has worked, mm -hmm. which is tragic as we've talked about before. Absolutely. So how do we come back? And, and yet, there, you know, people just won't let it go. So when people feel that they're being fed information that sits well inside them, it, it fits with their deep sense of knowing, which is what Hakeem was trying to talk about, then they relax. Mm -hmm. And then they feel they have to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. That's when you get your best feedback. Now, if we're going to get the full gist of the Amarna find in Turkey and the links to Atlantis in this 10,000 BC date uh, for the artifacts, then let's deal here with the Hall of Records that the Atlanteans were supposed to have put in the very heart of Egypt after their land was destroyed. Now, this is very interesting because it's a theme in esoteric literature, you know, the emerald tablets of Hermes. And the psychic Edgar Cayce, who helped to really reinvigorate this whole notion, placed this Hall of Records under the left paw of the Sphinx. So, uh, to their credit, you know, the Casey organization has tried to get some digs under the Sphinx and were basically manipulated by Zahi Hawass and others. Now, Casey's version puts the Hall of Records in three different places, uh, Yucatan, Bimini, and under the Sphinx. It's interesting to note here that although he's known for saying that the hall was under the Sphinx, he saw that as more of an entrance, and he said that the actual Atlantean Hall of Records was between the Sphinx and the Nile River, in a pyramid, he said, of its own. Now, we don't hear that part too often. So, my question is, um, what is your feeling, intuitively and otherwise, about this Hall of Records? Well, long answer to a big question. And let's also put the caveat on that if channeled material is 85% correct, there could be a little funny business in there. And, okay, so, uh, okay, now this, I had, when I lived in Egypt, I had a retreat center, and I called it the Hall of Records Retreat Center. Well, that's great. And so I've been I've been looking for this for a long time. Now I think there's because of linguistics as well, and how prepositions can change the meaning of words. And my PhD is in computational linguistics. So you know the Chinese people sit in a chair. We sit on a chair. Yes. Right. So when when Edgar Casey said under the Protestants, I was saying beneath and in front of. And the river used to just go there, but now, so circling all around, Lake Morris came all the way to where the Nile was. 
in my understanding, geologically speaking, and that's where Hawara is. Hmm. So I spent years, five years, in and out of the tunnel system on the Giza Plateau, having chased after this, uh, this story that I'd heard in 1996 at the Star Visions conference by Chelsea Floor, who was on the team with John Anthony West and Boris Syed and all of them that were doing the sledgehammer and the little arrow thing and drilled a hole. And I mean, these, this is primitive, primitive, primitive technology. Mm -hmm. And is there a cavity? Well, how big's the cavity? And well, there's a spaceship down there. Well, there's books down there. Well, well, what is down there? Wow. Now, emerald tablets, you know, ah, uh, ah, uh, hall of records of which there may have been more than one. What is it? Okay. So if, let's say, we came from off-planet and had starships and, you know, stuff, where would you put it? How do you acclimate coming from a different vibrational frequency on another planet? Where do you go to decompress? It's almost like being underwater. And if you go up too fast and then fly in a plane in 15 years, retinal detachments. Mm -hmm. Not something that looks direct, but the, the change in the pressure system and the different atmosphere is really uh, significant. So it could be, and this is what we're finding in Hawara with the geoscans, is this huge depth of, um, you know, that look almost like storehouses that don't connect with each other on two distinct levels, which to me says uh, two distinct time frames because older is deeper, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we could see water in front of the sinks, it doesn't mean it was the Nile if you go back 60,000 years or something. And uh -huh. Hawara is 30, I can't remember now, but many kilometers, much, much farther from the Nile than, say, Dendera, Abydos, again, older, is farther from the Nile, right? And so having, you know, gone on several expeditions, a desert expedition, when somebody suggested that, you know, the Hall of Records and connections to Atlantis, and it ended up being a, an, uh, an Air Force target. Right. So I've been chasing after this for a long time. There's no question. You have a strong connection to this Hall of Records. And I have to say that with the redating of the Sphinx to 10,500 BC by geologist Robert Schock, the discovery of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, also dating at 10,000 BC, your work in the Pyramid Code on this older date for Egypt, and now this explosive find in Turkey of Egyptian and goddess artifacts, I'm feeling like we're really closing in now on this Atlantean message. Now, uh, tell us about the new images we're going to be looking at here today. Now, what you're going to see is the Nassos stuff, too. Um, so there's not just the picture, and I think that at, at, in, on Crete, it's the closest we've got to the remnants of Atlantis. Mm -hmm. The way they dress, the acrobats that they're doing, the acrobatics that they're doing with the um, animals. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think that that is particularly interesting. Uh, and again, there's that goddess-centered thing. Oh, yeah. Well, and I remember that in terms of linking things to my past life stuff, when I first went there in 1977... I remember reading the sign and it said the Palace of King Minos. So I'm a kid, I'm 20-something. And I go, King? What do you mean, King? <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Who's that? Who are you talking <laughs> about? I was just so, you know, indignant. You know, and then I had a little conversation with myself, like, uh, what do you mean? <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> right. But then there was a showcase in the museum, and it had something that kind of looked like a safety pin. But it was a pin that would allow a rectangular woven fabric to gather at various spots to make fashion. Hmm. And and this pin was three, five thousand years old. And I remember my vision tumbled into the case and I just went, that was somebody's from then. And something grabbed me. This is the beginning of my book and, and pulled me outside. And um, and I, I was taken up to where it was just like an empty space. And I said, something happened here. Something used to happen here. It was this wonderful view of the site, but that, and there was everything, there was nothing there, like nothing, not a building, not a tree, nothing. So then I, I made a pledge to myself that I would um, keep looking until I figured out what that spot was. Yeah. And went and researched all this stuff, and I found a map of Nossos 
from ancient times, and that's where the sacred grove was. Priestesses would do their rituals naked in this oak grove, and the Christians came along and chopped all the trees down. <laughs> but something in me knew it already, and that's the essence of how I do my research. Well, I think your intuitive edge around these discoveries is going to lead us further into this labyrinth of mysteries. Now, let's go ahead here and take a look at these exclusive images, never before seen, from this landmark discovery. So these were part of the turkey find. And uh, if you look at that and then notice, so just trying to get some coordination here. Look at this. Does that not remind you of the same thing from Nassos? Now the other thing is you're not in a warring situation if you spend that much time on your hair. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know they're looking great. So look at this. This is fascinating. It's almost like a victory cup. But it's all jeweled. Like incredibly, incredibly neat. And that, so these came in both silver and gold. Mm -hmm. Back of it is an owl. Oh. Which is really speaking to the idea of uh, Artemis and all of that. Now, where's the rest of this? Oh. And this is a uh, falcon made out of 8,000 diamonds. Yeah, it's incredible. That's almost like uh, a Syrian or something. Well, I would have guessed Persian. Persian, yeah. Okay. So, it's quite fascinating. I thought there were a few more here. <laughs> These are incredible. They are incredible. The range of style, I think, is so interesting. Absolutely. But there were some things... There's all that electric ancient Egyptian stuff, too. Mm -hmm. Here's some of these. We'll even look at these vases. Look at them. They're like ancient female. Oh, yeah. Those are fascinating. So these aren't all in order, but um, there's stuff from, like, Artemis. See, there's the coins. This is just the whole collection. These tiny books. Um, what are these bearded men? What's going on there? Well, that's just a huge tapestry, and but they've got the feather, and that's a snake wrapped around him. Mm. This is like Atlantis imagery when I see that. Well, we don't really can't. It's hard to say where it's all from, but um, it is part of the the find. Mm -hmm. Now there's, I'm looking for that. I thought I'd copy them, Artemis and. Medusa, straight out of my book, all the goddess-centered stuff. This, well, I think I showed you this last time. That's like a, an emerald the size of a credit card. Let's see that one. So I'll take a screenshot of it, and then I'll put it in the folder for you. Yeah, that is incredible. Well, there's so much riches, and then there's, you know, suitcases full of gold bars. and Amazing news. But look at this thing. I'm going to rotate this a couple of times. Rotate clockwise. And then rotate it again. Now, they said this was 40,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Found in the Amazon. Like, the Amazon warrior women. Mm -hmm. In their stash. Look at that. Oh, it does, it does look like... <laughs> This, uh... The victory pass. Yeah, right. Incredible stuff. Fascinating. Yes. And then there's all these uh, mosaics on in, in the ground. Here, this is one of them. This is like pure goddess-centered stuff. All oh, right. With little angels. These into the folder and look at this is Medusa. There's a Medusa right there. Oh, yeah, right in the middle. And that's a hair comb, right? And then one more of Artemis here with 
you know, so she's a virgin goddess with many breasts and all that stuff from Nosos. The women are bare breasted. Mm -hmm. So the three I was looking for. So you can't say, you know, that it's not goddess centered. Oh, absolutely. If if they're bare breasted, I mean, it's just simply incredible. And like I said, no warring stuff, almost no boy stuff. And now there is the picture of the Atlantean princess, which we have shown. And one of the things I think is so important about that one is that you've talked about this posture, that this was a standing statue of a kind of regal princess from Atlantis. Well, it would have been standing, but that was that was lying down just simply because it was stuffed into a stash. I gotcha. I uh, gotcha. But it, it, it would have had to have been a standing posture. But it just, there's just, these things are all just thrown around in a cave. Right, right, yeah. But it really did look Thai because of the, the hand position, the headdress, and the, the pants were kind of gathered at the ankle. Mm -hmm. That's like a Thai style. Just amazing. And of course, for context, here's the original shot of the find with Akhenaten and Amenhotep III. Same location here, which suggests a massive hideaway of ancient artifacts related to Atlantis and goddess symbolism, really. This is a massive, largely untapped excavation site in a mountain in Turkey. Now, this, the Turkey find that has the 10 rooms inside the mountain that they locked is the gold Nefertiti Akhenaten with a lot of other rooms that they hadn't opened. They had only opened four of the 10. Just amazing. I can only imagine what else is hiding out there. And speaking of hiding out, are the investigators and the Turkish uh, treasure hunters safe? And what kind of a status update can you give us on them and the site? Are there any indications that they had to hand the material over to the military? I have no information that they had to give it away. My information is that it was locked and it wasn't safe for them to go back. Fascinating. Well, it makes sense with the military turmoil in that area right now, but it is the team that uh, locked the site, right? It's not the military. Yep. Okay, that's good. Like, I had personal contact with the, the people who found it. Good. I hope uh, to hear that they have access again soon. Carmen, just amazing. And as we close out this episode, I noticed a lot of Gnosis and Crete-style imagery in this batch. Now, can you tell us the significance of the Atlantean colonies in this context? All the pictures, they're matriarchal and they're gold. And all of that stuff that we saw, the bare-breasted women from Gnosis, Gnosis has been associated with Atlantis, the bull riding, the acrobatics, all that kind of stuff. So I think that what's at Knossos is the closest that we have of some kind of colony of people that were related to the Atlanteans somehow. Hot and cold, running water, two, three-story temples, just a huge sophistication of commerce, commerce and art that you, you, you just don't see anywhere else. It's likely to be, if we can connect these dots, we've got Atlantean colonies here. And